So welcome to Long Island Technologist Meetup. Our hope and dream is that this room is completely out of capacity and I have to sell tickets for you to get into the room. <laughs> but for today, it's fully free. I'm Justin. That's Mike. That's Matt. And I'm going to give it to this guy, who's the CTO and Chief Architect at Tulsa McCann, to take us through a cool problem that we solved for a really innovative business. Justin mentioned a problem we solved. We work with a company called Best Brain Education Strategies Technology. And they build applications for people who are recovering from traumatic brain injury. And two of those applications are called Strategize My Life and Pace My Day. Um, they're native mobile apps that help you when you're in recovery after a traumatic brain injury. And Strategize My Life, as the name uh, would imply, allows you to develop strategies for yourself when you find yourself in, in different situations. So for example, I'm going to make breakfast and I can open that up and I can work through a strategy I either developed with uh, myself, by myself or with my doctor or with someone who's uh, helping me through as occupational therapist, something like that. Um, and we build, we build a catalog of strategies. So the interesting thing is they have another app called Pace My Day. And when you're going through your day, Sometimes you find yourself stressed out by the amount you have to accomplish, especially after you've undergone a brain injury. So this application is designed to help you build your to-do list based on how you're feeling that day and based on how you're able to accomplish those tasks, either tell you to slow down or that you can handle more and track your progress over time to kind of check your improvement and help you feel better about your recovery. So unique problems. Uh, a lot of times we're building apps for users that are like ourselves. And I said, this is a very interesting app because it's one of those apps that I have, I have to, as a designer, you have to think empathetically about the people you're building for. But a lot of times the people we're building for, we sort of have some impression. Like if I'm building a shopping app, I go shopping, kind of know what that feels like. I don't entirely know what this experience is like for these folks. So we get a lot of our feedback from users actually using the applications and understanding kind of what they're confused by. And a lot of times they're confused by things that I would never have pictured before. So on top of the apps needing to be incredibly accessible, they have some odd usage patterns that we didn't anticipate and that we, we don't usually see. So when we, I want to talk a little bit about how we build a traditional app, which will kind of tee up the, the, the kind of problem we're talking about. So we have a, a native application and we have your phone and we'll draw like a little smartphone with the old school button because it's more recognizable, right? <laughs> so, so you're, you're working on a device and normal application, right? This device is going to communicate with a server somewhere. And so we kind of have you know, your server and you have your, your device up here. And <clears throat> device communicates with the server, saves the data, shoots the data, back to, shoots the data back to the device. And this is pretty much how you're building mobile apps all the time. There's, someone mentioned Firebase earlier, right? They're usually using Firebase or something like that to keep this in sync. Um, and so one of the things that usage patterns that came up was that people are using multiple devices at the same time, which is kind of a unique pattern. So sometimes people would do something on their phone, but then they'd want to switch to their tablet because they were cooking and they could see better and it was larger. So this is fairly, so you have like, now you have device one and we have like a device two scenario, right? It could be a computer or another, a tablet. We have device two. And this is fairly straightforward, right? You kind of have like the, the two devices are communicating. Everything's hitting the server. Everything's keep, kept in sync, just like a video game, right? So a video game will hit a central server and everything works without issue. Um, so this was kind of how we originally thought about the app. This was how the old app suite was built as well. It was built using Firebase and you could communicate this way. But one of the things they ran into was people would frequently find themselves in situations of intermittent connectivity. And that presents a new challenge. So let's say device one is no longer online. <clears throat> How do we get the data to device two? That's a lot more complicated. Really can't 
can't actually happen in this way. But the problem is the users, these users really become frustrated. Whereas you and I would note, like when you go into Facebook and your feed is not refreshing, you kind of get it, right? Like, ah, I'm offline. Like something, I went into a bridge, whatever you don't, I'll, I'll come back to it later. Or it just kind of appears to work. So like Spotify or one of these other apps, you can download, it'll store data on the device itself. So you still have read access to everything you wanted, which is one good situation that you can have, but you can't really interact with anything because it doesn't have access to the server anymore. So this presented pretty new problem to us. Um, the other thing that we were thinking about was we really wanted to build these apps for iOS and Android. And they had had struggles in the past because typically you'll have to build an iOS app in one language, which would be Swift or something like that. And then, and then the Android app would be built in Kotlin or something different. So you have to maintain two code bases to do these. So to your face, you know where I'm going with this already. You already know where I'm going with this. So the first kind of weapon to kind of start wrangling this, right, is how do we have apps that can work off multiple devices? We use React Native. It allows you to build native apps across platforms with a single language and a single code base. So we never really have to worry too much about the concept of maintaining two code bases and maintaining business logic in two places. So this is really kind of nice. How can we solve this server issue? Well, talking before, each of these devices, it's pretty common to have a database that lives on the device itself. So we sat down and we were, we used SQLite, which was a great little solve for now this app works on multiple devices with the same code base and locally. It never really needs a server at all, other than this like little syncing problem that we still haven't solved, right? So we now know with the, with these kind of the Spotify situation, most of those apps you're okay with read access and you go to search songs and it starts to not work and you're like, okay, whatever, I must be offline. I got to try and figure out my internet situation. But again, these users are not feeling that. You get the, the heavy hand, you'll, you'll start to end up with, with a weird situation. So by allowing everything to happen on one device like this with the single SQLite database, we can sort of say, hey, everything's going to work here. And then we'll send data to a central database here when we have connection. So we basically said, all right, using React Native, we've solved the code, multiple code base problem. The business logic is going to live right here in the client. But, and we'll sync the data to the server. That's really nice. But what happens when people make changes here and changes here, and they're all kind of hitting the server at once. We sort of ran into this issue of how do we keep the data in sync? So, so I, maybe I star a category in this device, then I switch to this device and I do a bunch of stuff to the same, same object, so to speak, in that database. And you start to run into these issues. And on top of that, you run into this kind of issue of this thing's broken. Here's a screenshot of what I'm seeing. Who's been in that situation, right? It's like, oh, it broke. I did this. It just feels like it's breaking. What's, what's happening? I don't really know what's happening. So it, we started to rethink this a little bit. We had this traditional app and it was just like a CRUD app that, that's, uh, I remember I told this to Justin for the first time and he said, he thought to myself, this app isn't CRUD. It's like, <laughs> so so, so the, the, the CRUD part stands for like create, read, let's do update, delete, right? Every time a piece of data comes down, we update a row in a database. And I'm kind of going into this for some of you, this may be super obvious, but I figure we have a mixed audience. So it's worth kind of going over. So typical application, you update the row in a database and it just deletes the whole item, puts a new item in there, which makes this debugging problem really hard because I'm always storing the end state and I have actions that are happening all over the place. I have actions that are happening in multiple devices with different levels of connectivity. And I have to derive the user story of what happened from this row in the database that's displaying incorrect data and the story that a user is telling me. 
These are all the steps I did. And you're sort of left in this place where you have an intuition about what may have happened. And you have this pretty complicated system. How many people have heard of event sourcing before? Uh, only because you told me. This is the fun stuff. So event sourcing, has anybody used GitHub before? You have all used event source systems. So there you go. The, the, GitHub is event sourcing. It tracks your code changes over time, and it has a history of every single change you've ever made to the database. It's storing it as a log. You've also used event sourcing if you have a bank account. Your bank account computes the total of your checking account by running through all the transactions that have ever happened, not simply storing the end result. Otherwise, people could say, I deposited $1,000 in the account on this day. What happened to it? Right? I know what happened to it. You didn't deposit $1,000. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we have these devices now. And instead of sending the same exact create interaction, read interaction, update interaction, delete that action, trying to maintain this database, right? Like trying to keep this server side database in sync with X number of devices, because it doesn't have to be, you know, it can be this many devices, you know, three, four, whatever. We're not, we now say, send me what you did on this device. So instead of saying, update the category, we're going to send an event over and we're going to say, what is the name of that event? We had a series of names. So let's just say that event is update category. We can just sort of do that and we'll have a payload and that payload will include the timestamp from the device that it happened. It'll include whatever data is needed to update. So maybe it's the name, maybe it's an image, maybe it's something like that. Um, and we can send these over in batches, which is really cool. So the other thing that was really cool about this, uh, these event payloads is whenever this device, let's say this device went offline and then popped back online, instead of it having to send over each, to, each thing as like 100 network requests, let's say you use this for a whole day offline. You had 1,000 requests. We allow you to now send 1,000 events into our server. Our server keeps an event log of those events and it'll place them in order based on the timestamp. So if this device was offline, but this one was online, and then another device comes back online at a different time, we order, we can reorder all the events. So we make sure we keep the chronology proper. When did it actually happen on the device? Not simply when did it happen in the server? Because the source of truth now is the client as opposed to the server, which is kind of contrary to how we would build pretty much every other app. Usually the server is the source of truth and the client isn't. In this world, these become the source of truth about when events happen. And we, have, we keep a ledger, just like your bank account, of every single thing that's happened on the app. And then when this app makes a request, it replays all the events and builds the final state at the end. If we ever sit here and find, hey, I just sent a whole bunch of events that actually should have happened at a different time. We can replay them on all the devices. We can actually, every device when it connects can say, hey, the last time I synced, I'm behind by some amount, just like GitHub. So when you kind of ask GitHub, hey, let me pull, it'll either tell you you're up to date, all your code's up to date, or you're not up to date, you're this many commits behind. We can tell how many commits behind you are through this event payload. The other side of this, is now when people say to me, what, I'm here, it's broken, what happened? You can always go back to the event log and see every single thing that they did and replay it and actually see the state of the app at every given point. I can even figure out, oh, it looks like you deleted the category here and then updated it here and there's, there's an incongruence there. Maybe, that, maybe because this was offline, they saw the category, they edited it, I can repair the event log and say, hey, these things were supposed to happen in a different order or fix the bug that caused that to happen in the first place or simply add another, technically your event log in, in our case and in most event source systems, the way to repair it is to add kind of the, re the repair event to the event log. Don't modify the event log. Keep it in pure state at all times. Um, 
And this really kind of helped us solve that issue of how do we figure out, A, what's happening across these different apps, but how do we keep a single database in sync when you have three different databases on each device that need access to the same data? You couple that with the fact that each app, separate applications, also need to be able to access each other's data within the same device, which our, which our event source system now kind of helps us wrangle that into a series of events that happen across, event, across, these, across these devices. <laughs> cool. Anyway, uh, any questions? Would it be a conflict if the other online, two other online devices trying to send an event to the server? In GitHub, you have the ability to solve merge conflicts. And that's kind of one of the, the challenges to building the server side system is you're not going to ask the user, hey, you have a merge conflict in your data. Yeah. So we went on the side of every update. There's, there's three types of events kind of at their core. There's create events. There's update events and delete events. Create events are going to build a new object. The update event in it will always overwrite. So we always err on the side of we will overwrite in order. So if these devices send in payloads with a with the later with a more recent timestamp, those updates will beat these the any updates that happened on an offline device that comes later. There is still a conversation we're having about let's say this device was like offline for years, like my iPad 2 or something like that, and I throw it online and it shoves a bunch of events over. We can sort of set an expiration date and say, hey, if any events are older than 30 days, sync with the old database, blow these away. So we now have the option of saying, hey, these events are too old. This device was offline for too long. We're not going to attempt to sync those. But ideally, those events even would go to the back of the backlog and the more recent events would take over because it would still rerun all the events in order that way. But you do need a merge strategy that's like, you basically dictate it. Whereas with GitHub, you can kind of do all sorts of stuff. We were talking about that, like, oh, rebase, things like that. I'm going to assume that you're using an optimistic UI strategy um, just to say, like, things offline, but it still needs to look like it works. So you click a star button, and it looks like you've liked something. But because you're offline, you're, you, the server doesn't know, and your devices don't know, but the device you used has to show like it knows, right? Well, it does, it does know in this system. So you're never actually, unless you're disconnected from the SQLite database, which can't happen. It's right, yeah, the database is on there. So right, you don't right, even right. need an optimistic UI. You like it, it's liked. Mm -hmm. It sends the like event over. Now, this device may not know about it until the event reaches the database and it can refetch. So that's the difference. But in terms of... But at some point, that like will make it over. Let's say you like it here and you like it here. Those two events will show up here, but it won't matter. They'll basically They'll be, be the doing same the anyway. same exact thing. You'll end up with the same aggregate. So we actually call them aggregates. So like you have your event source, and then your aggregate is, is sort of what you would consider like a model in, in like a, another framework. And that mm -hmm. would be like categories. We strategize my life has strategies. It'll bring up that same strategy. So you don't really need the optimistic UI because it's all happening instantly to SQLite. And this is really, the, these are all sources of absolute truth. They just kind of, in the background, they're actually sending those events over. So it's not the, so we don't wait for the event to hit to update the UI basically. Right. They, they're just interacting with SQLite. This payload's happening in the background and we have a single package that can be shared through, um, we use a, a mono repo tool called NX. Yep. So it's a library that all of the apps share that runs their own little event queue in the background. And, if, and it'll send these payloads over. If there's no connectivity, it'll build them up and then fire them over in one shot. But the actual app itself works perfectly smoothly as though you were never offline. At right. All so times. you're basically your, your client side the whole way. Your client side right? everywhere. That's what's happening there. And then um, in terms of like, if you are continuously connected, meaning that there's no truck problem in service, is there like a like a polling that happens to, to to I guess synchronize or how does that how does that happen? It's just post requests over. So like every time an event happens, it's sort of like a after the event, 
send this, you know, after after an update, there's a hook that just fires the event over okay, to the so server. Okay, so it kind of does like a normal kind of client-side stuff for as long as things are connected because there'll be an individual events that are going back and forth. Until there's no connectivity, it'll then batch them. And then when there is, and, ha and are you identifying like when there's connectivity and then sending, or are you waiting for the next event? Well, yeah, we'll identify when there's connectivity and then send. So like that we'll kind of, listen for that and those are like react native packages and they'll send over the batch but exactly what you're saying like like in, in like i could be developing locally on my machine that all works if github is like if i can't get to github it's it's all still working on my machine it's right. the same concept like if they can't get to the server this will still work the difference is these devices no matter what these devices can't access the data you've updated here without an obvious server ping but they're still interactive and usable and they'll retroactively pull in those updates behind the behind the scenes. And so even if you, and the cool thing is a user might make the updates twice, not realizing it's fine. Like you just will see that too. I could say, oh, it looks like you did this twice, but it's not a big deal. It, they cancel each other out. I had a question. I don't know if we solved this yet, but um, two device uh, operationally using two devices offline but syncing the experience between the two offline devices in, in real time. You, you can actually do that technically. So no matter what you need, you'll need this server, especially if those two devices, because some of the people have an iOS phone and an Android tablet. So like, like even with like iOS devices, like you could try some like iCloud syncing, but no matter what, you know, there, there's likely some scenario where we could like Bluetooth them together yeah, or something. But, <laughs> Again, like thinking to the population, like we want to keep the tech kind of like pretty much, we don't want that kind of tech happening. So two offline devices, you'll, you'll like, you'll have to connect the server to link them together with one account. But the cool thing is people can actually start using the app if they don't care about any of this. That was like a big part of why we did this. You never need this. The server is completely unnecessary. You can just completely use this locally without... Imagine something QR like that you could go to a page that was the event log that you could go to another another app that was like, hey, scan the event log and then it would update completely offline. Oh, no, I'm talking literally low tech QR code, right? Camera on one device, QR code on the other that comes up on the app and says, you know, event log sync or one of some other, you know, funny name for it. You scan it. It is the event log. And you could just boom, it's like on the, the event log embedded into like a QR, into our, code. not, I mean, not exactly QR code. So you, would you have keep to a local app. event log and then like, I mean, yeah, we have it already, right? We do have it. Although we do clear it out cause the SQL, like just so the SQL I database, but, but technically you don't, I mean, have how to long are you going to be offline? But yeah, I mean, that's what I'm thinking is that there's your way of, of offline sync. If you want to just encode the data as something that as a picture is practically QR like, and you just put on another device as a camera and then it knows what to do. It would be interesting to see like, if you could embed like JSON data into, into, into yeah, some I mean, kind there's, of encoding. There's, there's encoding strategies for that. So I think that could be really good. Oh, that's kind of interesting. I like that. The concept of the event log, like running the entire event log to build your aggregates at some point will become a very large operation, right? It's sort of like the blockchain, right? Like having to like comb the whole chain your bank account closes the books every month. So it's technically not running your bank account from the beginning of time. It's running it from the end of the month, the month previous. So it's just going from statement to statement. So we had talked about this idea here of, of having like the cash as this, because it's not, not needed on day one of, hey, every 30 days we close the books and then we always run the event log from that point forward so that we don't have to always run the whole event log. Talking about that idea, if you're closing the book such that the event log as like tabular data is maybe only one viewport of data, you could technically like scan it and like AI parse it. I, I was really a big fan of this event source because they were, they were always kind of pitched as being really complicated to use. Um, there's like a CQRS type architecture that people talk about. And I had always thought, oh, this, it actually isn't all that complicated. You can actually see a lot more of your apps architected this way. The thing that I love about it is the event log and debugging. Like when people call up and say that there was a problem, you're just like, look up the device. You can see all the logs and you're like, oh, I can step through this. I can even replay the UI 
from all of these events so I can actually watch your actions happen without any kind of like weird like hot jar like screen recording technology being on there. No light, it's all GDPR compliant. <laughs> the exception of needing to clear the event log at some point, you do need to delete that if in those cases. All right. Anybody else want to talk about something? <laughs> so I can open the floor to.